Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, a site selector and economist will discuss economic development in Arizona and find out about new research that could put the brakes on inflammation. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Steve Goldstein, in for Ted Simons. Arizona Public Schools got their report cards today, and there was some improvement. According to information released by the State Department of Education, there were about 60 more schools that got an A for the last school year than the previous year. About two-thirds of the schools earned either an A or a B. 21% of schools improved at least one letter grade. 14% fell one letter grade. Those grades were based on Ames test results. A bus strike started at midnight in the East Valley. Tens of thousands of commuters were forced to find other ways to get around today. The Amalgamated Transit Union, Local 1433, represents about 400 bus drivers in the Southeast Valley, and the union called a strike after failing to reach an agreement with First Transit, which runs the buses there. The Bus Drivers Union says they are striking over management rights in First Transit's contract with Valley Metro. Union officials feared that contract would allow Valley Metro to order First Transit to cut wages or working hours. A smoking ban went into effect today at Arizona State University campuses. The new rule bans smoking and the use of smokeless tobacco at all ASU properties. That applies to private cars parked in ASU parking lots. ASU police say they won't be fining smokers, but instead will be informing them about the new smoking ban. Economic development is a constant topic for government and business leaders. For site selectors, it's their job. Site selectors help companies in search of new territory find the best deal in terms of economic and tax incentives. Site selector John Lenio, economist and managing director of CBRE's Economic Incentives Group, and economist Jim Browns of the Elliott D. Pollock and Company are here now to discuss economic development in Arizona. Gentlemen, welcome. Good to see you. John, how do companies decide where they're going to expand and how do they decide if they're going to expand? So usually if companies decide that they need to expand, it's because business demand is growing. So whether a company is building widgets or a company is selling financial services, that creates demand for jobs. So typically companies are usually, they vote with their feet based on where they can hire people. So it's all labor market driven at the end of the day. How's Arizona doing lately? Very competitively. You know, Ar Arizona and especially Greater Phoenix and Greater Tucson areas are falling on our short lists. When companies are looking to hire 200 jobs, whether it's financial services or manufacturing, Phoenix has the depth of the, of the labor base at a reasonable cost relative to other major markets, which is kind of keeping it toward the top five on the list. Jim, what do you think about what John said? Uh, spot on. About four years ago, we collaborated with John somewhat on our economic development report where we ranked Arizona compared to a lot of other states. And we had us as the only state without a major economic development program. So we had us near the bottom. So we've moved up quite a bit. We're probably in the middle of the pack, but that's actually a good thing because a lot of states are giving away more than they should in incentives. It's better to be a state that's not necessarily number one in terms of volume, but number one in terms of intelligently providing these things. You know folks are a little bit cynical though when it comes to things like the Arizona Commerce Authority and GPAC yeah. as far as what they're actually accomplishing. What are they accomplishing, and are they working together? Should they be working together more? They're, they're collaborating quite a bit, and, and that was one of the things that we thought was important. We thought we needed to establish the tools, and then we needed the right people to manage those tools, and the only way to do it effectively is uh, to collaborate. And so we're seeing them significantly involved in business location deals, which is helping the employment base. John, what kind of impact is that having? I think it has a significant impact because when companies are looking at the greater Phoenix area or Arizona in, in particular, they want to know that the state is aligned with the community, is aligned with the, um, the regional marketing group because at the end of the day, all of our competitors, whether it's Kansas City, Charlotte, or Columbus, everybody's at the, at the table singing from the same songbook. John, what about California? There was the big push, this idea that California's taxes were going up, that California was in a hole. And certainly, I guess the tax policy remains in effect, but it's still California. The economy is still bouncing back, still some major communities there. Is Phoenix, is Arizona going to be able to attract some of those jobs that the optimistic folks said they would be able to? I think so, yes. One, because going back to the, the labor question, it costs less to employ people here. That's what's a big driver. Our business, business uh, taxes are lower compared to California. So I, I don't see any um, anything changing. If not, I see it improving in terms of jobs moving across the border. And that gets back to that intelligent economic development because we could be working on a deal or at least monitoring a deal where the labor costs are driving the majority of the discussion and the incentives 
are much less than maybe the labor market savings if they came here versus another area. So it also gets to promotion. We have the coordination between the economic development entities, but if we can keep better promoting the state, we can get just as much of a benefit as when we have to hand out dollars to get those select base sector companies that pay high wages. John, is this community improving as far as education goes? People are concerned about K-12. They're also concerned about this idea that, again, unlike California, we don't have a lot of universities, a lot of institutes of higher education. I, I, we don't receive any negative criticism from our clients about our education system. I mean, the reality is for higher skill set positions, there are people out there who are educated, who have the degrees that we can find reasonably. And again, it's all relative to other major metro areas. You know, despite that fact, there's, you know, there's really no negative criticism that comes up at all. Jim, what about education? Uh, that's a tough one. When, when we talk about infrastructure investment, intellectual infrastructure, physical infrastructure, when you put down a road, you can stand on the road, you can drive on the road, it's easy to promote. Education, it's more of a long-term play. And so it's a little bit more difficult to bring that to the table in the economic development discussion. What I would hope that we do is not let things deteriorate to the point where somebody like John would come in and say, education is an issue. Mm -hmm. So you have to take care of these things early on. There was one negative that really stands out to me, and it's one, I don't want to make too big a deal out of it, but there was Google that expanded, and when Google came in, oh my gosh, flashes of lightning, everyone was excited, and then when Google sort of left, it was much quieter. Why didn't a Google work here? Is that, and the reason Google left, is that still a concern that people living here should worry about? Well, I'm not sure why Google left, uh, but usually when companies are looking to relocate, either you know their business plan does not work here, they cannot find the quality of the of the employees or even of the students. Um, that's typically the reason why, why companies leave at the end of the day. So endemically within the greater Phoenix area in Arizona, there's really nothing uh, systemically wrong, I think, at the end of the day. It's just, as Jim had mentioned, in terms of business development efforts, it's getting the word out mm -hmm. that Arizona is open for business. Jim, let's come back to Google. Uh, what do we know about why Google left? And, and is there a concern that that could be, we, we attract another big name? Does it look bad for Arizona to attract a big name and then lose it? No, because a lot of companies are basically employing for hire. They'll go to one state, they get another incentive three years later when that deal is done, and then they'll uh, uh, move to Texas. Usually Texas is a place where they go to because they overpay. And that's fine, they're creating their next fiscal crisis. But when you look at one company, whether or not they, they, they want to stay here, um, you can import labor if you need it. Mm -hmm. yeah, filling, filling the void for one company is not a problem. And so normally you would suspect that there's other things going on as well. John, who do you think our biggest competitors are? It doesn't have to be a short list, it could be a long one, but mm -hmm. who should we really be looking out for? So typical competitors on our short list are Denver, uh, Dallas, Austin, Columbus, and Charlotte mm -hmm. tend to pop on the list. Atlanta is there also. So really, all these major metro markets have the same features. They have a deep labor base, they have great real estate, they have a great tax structure, and really, at the end of the day, it's all about how the government entities are, are collaborating together that wins the deal. How much attention should we pay to economic development rankings? They come out frequently. Mm -hmm. The average person is not sure which ones are really accurate and make sense. Right. Even if we're not sure what list to look for, what are some factors in those lists we could look at? Well, major factors really are corporate number of corporate relocations. So it's basically number of businesses who announce that they're locating. The amount of capital investment is a big metric because ultimately companies that spend a lot of money on equipment or buildings actually make money for the communities at the end of the day. From our business, and even for the clients that, that we work with, the rankings are great, but we only pay attention to them in the first five seconds, and then you get down to the real numbers. Jim, what about that? I, I hate the majority of most of the ranking <laughs> studies, and, and it's because they're so flawed. There was one study that came out that got a lot of attention just this past quarter, and our position moved quite a bit, so we dug down into the numbers, and we found out that even though our ranking was 19 in the country, that the margin for error, error could have put us at number one or number 50. Well, just, you could just guess, and you're just as accurate as coming up with a, a, an official ranking. So in most of these cases, they're using bad data, mm -hmm. or they have these large margins for error, and unfortunately, that information gets out there. But how do you counter that? You promote the state, and you address these issues when they come up. Well, so what sort of information to you makes sense for the average person, the person who's not an economist who can dig in like the two of you can? Well, it's tough because a lot of them, they, they say it's based on a survey, it's based on economic data. You can dig up the economic data and you can look at their numbers. The more credible ones will post the numbers and you can look at it a little bit more closely. Mm -hmm. But then you have groups like the Commerce Authority, and I think GPEC may or may not be looking at this, I think they are, where if we're ranked poorly, let's figure out why. If we're deficient in an area, let's address it. If it's a bad ranking, 
let's fly there or give them a call and say, you have a flaw in your study, you might want to look at it more carefully, and then all of a sudden Arizona's ranked 10 higher the next year. So we have to address them one by one. John, let's come back to the issue of economic incentives, incentives that Jim brought up before. There was some trouble in Phoenix. People bring up City North as, as the real attraction that, that was horrible, this big white elephant, as some would say. When it comes to economic incentives, mm -hmm. attracting companies and businesses you work with, what makes sense? Are there economic incentives that still make sense? Is that for a while a pejorative for folks that we should try to stay away from those? Mm -hmm. Well, the downside with staying away from providing incentives is that you lose your ability to compete for big projects, whether it's a headquarters or manufacturing. So incentives are important. So the current, tool, current um, toolkit, tax credits, cash grants, job training, those are the top three that most every other competitive state has. So from our, our point of view, incentives always comes up usually about 90% of the time because okay. companies are very sophisticated now. Jim, what incentives make sense? And at what point, you mentioned you made fun of Texas a little bit. I noticed that, Jim. What can Arizona do to avoid falling into that kind of trap? It, it's about managing the incentives well. And, and I, I've been on the fence on the incentives uh, issue for a while. Um, I, I'm all for government getting out of the way of business and letting them operate and maximize their opportunities. Mm -hmm. But what pushed me over on the economic development side of the fence a little bit is the commitment that we've had so far to manage them properly, not give away more than we're getting in return, really think about whether or not we want to be spending the money on certain companies, going after the higher value added companies that have a lot of other spin-off jobs and enhance our economy. So as long as we keep managing them well and we're not giving away too much, I'll be a supporter. If we go in that other direction, then it gets a little bit more questionable. John, as we're in a position as the economy has not recovered quite as fast as people would like, the job market's still a little bit slower than people would like. When we look at incentives, when we look at trying to draw businesses here to Phoenix or to Arizona, should there be a concern that there are certain kind of jobs, Jim talks about, we want the higher wage jobs, of course, sure. but as fewer people are being hired, are we going to have more part-time jobs? Are we going to have, as people worry about whether they're actually going to pay health benefits? Mm -hmm. How does that work in terms of drawing businesses and what should, and you're talking about it from a business point of view, but from, right. from a state point of view, what sort of businesses should we want to attract? Can we attract those higher level businesses that we all talk about? Mm -hmm. So our economist geek speak is always, we're looking for the biggest ripple effects. When you drop a river rock in a pond, you want the deepest ripples at the end of the day. So for those higher wage jobs, those, that creates demand for those part-time jobs, for the lower level service and retail jobs. Mm -hmm. So from the, from the state standpoint, they don't have to worry about that because that's a symptom of doing their job right, which is attracting these the bigger name companies that hire a lot of people with a lot of investment in high salaries. Jim, what about that, part-time versus full-time? Uh, we're at the point in the recovery where we're not adding the higher value added jobs just yet, but this is normal. Mm -hmm. We're going to be adding the construction related jobs, the service oriented jobs. So right now I'm not worried about it at all. If we're still talking about that in two or three years, I'd be more worried. So expect part-time jobs right now, the jobs that maybe don't have the health benefits, but things are going to change quite a bit. It's already improved. We're number eight in the country in terms of employment growth. It's going to change a lot in the next couple of years. So we're moving in the right direction and don't be worried just yet if it's not a hundred thousand dollars a year in terms of the annual salary on the jobs that we're creating that's not normal economics so if in two years we're having the same conversation then we can maybe start to say what are we doing poorly because we're not keeping up with how we used to grow and final question you think we're heading in the right direction we're heading in the right direction okay. I've never heard the term geek applied to economists before but um, we're moving in the right direction and um, I'm happy with what I'm seeing on the economic development front I think everybody's really trying their best and we're seeing, um, we're, we're, we're seeing decent business locations so far in the state that we wouldn't have seen otherwise. And John, as you said, you're not hearing negative things about Arizona, so I presume you also think we're moving in the right direction. I think we are. Um, the reality is it's only been about three to four years since our economic development sophistication got enhanced. Typically, across the U.S., it takes sometimes five to ten years mm -hmm. until you actually see a big blip in the data. So I, I think from a mindset point of view, the state, the communities, the regions are all working well together. And it's all a matter of doing business development, getting people to look at Arizona. John, Jim, thanks very much for the conversation. Thanks. I appreciate it. You're welcome.
Expand your horizon with the Arizona Horizon website. To get there, go to azpbs.org. Click on the Arizona Horizon tab at the top of the screen. Once there, you can access many features. Watch interviews by clicking on the video button. You can also find out what's on Arizona Horizon for the coming week. If you would like an RSS feed, a podcast, or want to buy a video, that's all on the website too. Want to learn about specific topics like immigration or the legislature? You can visit our special web sections. Show your support for Arizona Horizon at azpbs.org slash Arizona Horizon. Inflammation is something we all deal with as we age. It can strike in many places and cause a variety of ailments. But there is hope. A team led by a University of Arizona researcher has discovered a previously unknown mechanism that prevents the immune system from going into overdrive. That could shed light not only on how our body controls its responses to pathogens, but also on conditions such as autoimmune diseases, allergies, and chronic inflammation. The group found a protein thought to play a role only in blood clotting can tell defense cells to slow down, thereby preventing an immune reaction from spiraling out of control. Sarav Ghosh, assistant professor in the Department of Cellular and Molecular Medicine at the U of A College of Medicine, and Dr. Jonathan Layton of the Mayo Clinic in Arizona join me now to discuss the new findings. Dr. Layton, you work with a lot of people who suffer from inflammatory bowel disease. How will this new discovery affect them? Uh, I think that it's uh, very important. If you start from uh, the concept of inflammation, inflammation is actually very important uh, as a way that the body defends itself against bacteria. Uh, and uh, so if someone gets a cut or if you get a res upper respiratory uh, infection, it's the inflammatory process that actually defends the body and clears the infection. Uh, the difference is in those conditions, the, imp the body knows to turn the inflammation off. Mm -hmm. Now, if we shift gears to chronic inflammatory conditions like inflammatory bowel disease, uh, the body does uh, start that inflammatory process, but for some unknown reason, uh, the body doesn't know to turn that inflammation off, and so that leads to chronic inflammatory diseases and then other sequelae uh, from that. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's always been uh, you know, uh, something that we have wanted to understand better is what does that. So if we take uh, inflammatory bowel disease, for example, there are three main etiologies that we think contribute. One is genetics, two is the environment, mm -hmm. and then the third is the immune system and that inflammation. And again, what a lot of research uh, is uh, focused on is trying to understand why the body doesn't turn off that inflammation. And that's where uh, Surav uh, and his coworkers have uh, done some incredible work in that area and have identified a possible mechanism. And Surav, it's been a long process. This is not something that happened overnight. People, when they hear research, when they hear conclusions, they want to believe there was some sort of revelation that happened, but this took a while. Right, so uh, let me first um, start by acknowledging the people who did the work. Um, I co-led this work with Carla Rotlin. She is at Yale University, she's a professor, and her team. And then, of course, it was a pleasure working with clinicians like Jonathan Layton, Anthony Perry, who is a pathologist at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Gilbert now. And Carla and I, uh, we were postdoctoral research fellows at the Salk Institute in La Jolla. So this is an institute founded by Jonas Salk, who discovered polio vaccine. And uh, it's been about 10 years. So it's 10 years back that we started trying to understand the function of a molecular circuit. So imagine this is a molecular signal that functions within innate immune cells. So these are the first of uh, the defense cells in the body that that immediately responds to an infection, a pathogen, a bacteria, or a virus. And this breaking mechanism uh, is something that operates within these cells, disengaging them. And this is, some, this is what we had discovered before, but at the time, we didn't know in the body, in the context of an actual immune response, what's the signal that pushes this break, sort of? How is this engaged? And that's what we have discovered recently in terms of the function of protein S. Without getting us too much into scientific speak that most of us won't understand, what does it look like when researchers first see the difference and feel like, okay, now I realize why the immune system is reacting that way? What looks different? Uh, so, so it's, as you said, it's a long process. It's mainly, um, you know, 
expected results or fail, lots of failures, and then there are those wow moments that we live for. And in this case, what we did was we took advantage um, of genetic techniques such as generating an animal, a mouse model. Um, you know, it's a mammalian model, close, closest approximation that we have um, in terms of uh, understanding diseases in humans. We could actually genetically take out the gene that makes codes for the protein, protein S, only specifically in the T cells. And this animal then suffered from uh, increased overzealous inflammatory response, chronic inflammation. And that was the sort of the, the proof, the, the absolute proof that we're looking for. But this has been a process of deductive reasoning. Um, you know, Sherlock Holmes is one of my favorite characters, and this was thinking where the signal might come from. Um, and, uh, you know, to explain that, I will have to tell you a little bit about the, uh, the, the process of immune response. In very general terms, mm -hmm. when you have an infection, you have a first line of response. Uh, these are the innate immune cells, and they, their job is to respond very quickly, but rather non-specifically. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter which bacteria you are getting, it's a general response making a lot of chemicals to try to contain the, the infection. Now, if this persists, however, there is collateral damage because there's a lot of toxic chemicals that the body is making trying to fight off the infection. In the process of a normal physiological immune response, what happens is a gradual progression where these innate immune cells sort of hand off the baton to very spe specialized, specific cells that attacks the particular bacteria. And these doesn't have the associated collateral response. So we were thinking where would the signal to turn off the innate immune response come from? And obviously we deduced it could be this. Once you have engaged a specific response, which is fine-tuned, without this um, collateral damage, that might in turn give the signal to the innate immune cells to disengage, to, to calm down. Dr. Layton, let's come back to the practical application of this. So based on what Sir Rob has said, tell us a little bit more. Yeah, so I think that what's uh, very exciting about this is they studied this in the lab, uh, studied it in animals, uh, found a possible mechanism, and then what we call translational research, then took it into humans. And so, of course, they uh, identified this protein S, which again is normally involved in blood clotting, uh, and they uh, identified reasons to think that this protein S uh, might provide that negative feedback uh, to those uh, initial, uh, initial uh, inflammatory cells. Mm -hmm. And so what we did was we took uh, patients with inflammatory bowel disease and tested them for their uh, protein S levels. And we found uh, pretty consistently that their protein S levels are low. Mm -hmm. And so if, you, if in fact uh, protein S, so just to remember what we're saying is that Remember I said that the problem in chronic inflammatory conditions is the body doesn't know to turn itself off. And uh, Surov and Carla's work suggests that protein S may be that negative feedback me mechanism to turn the inflammation off. Mm -hmm. You can imagine if protein S levels are low uh, and there is not enough available, then uh, the protein S can't give the feedback to turn that inflammation off. If in fact that turns out to be the case, then that uh, then leads to possible ways of treating these chronic conditions uh, and, and uh, reducing the inflammation. So there's uh, huge implications if, in fact, this is the mechanism. Just a few seconds left, Sarah. I want to give you a chance to, to give us sort of the overview. Right. So protein S is this molecular break, breaking mechanism. It's the signal that's picked up by receptors on the innate immune cells. This would be an analogous to antennas, small, small antennas that will pick up the protein S signal, telling the cells, okay, calm down, you've done your job, okay. right? It's time to hand, hand it over to the adaptive response. And as Jonathan alluded, it was really uh, a an, an very interesting finding that the patients uh, who are suffering from chronic inflammatory diseases, they do not have this key signaling molecule. Mm -hmm. So there is no way for the innate immune cells to learn that the job is done. Gentlemen, fascinating. Thank you so much for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's the Journalist Roundtable. The battle over electric deregulation heats up as more companies come out in opposition. And opponents of Arizona's new campaign contribution limits law file a challenge. That's Friday on the Journalist Roundtable.
Thanks very much for watching tonight. Hope you have a great evening. See you tomorrow. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.